Hi, um, everyone. I'm Nicolas Grigoriadis. I'm going to talk to you guys about how to write less documentation and get computers to do a little bit more to, of it for you. Um, I'm from Internet Solutions. And uh, yeah, well, our offices are literally just next door, as Ritwana said. And um, so what I'm planning to present to you is two more minutes. Must I restart? Yeah, yeah. Fine, Carl, I'll do that. People are still moving into venues. Are they? Yeah. OK. I'll wait. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pretend that you didn't hear anything. <laughs> True. Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick. Um, I'm working at Internet Solutions. Um, offices are literally next door on the campus. And um, today I'm going to talk about how, to you, how you can use Python to make writing documentation just a little bit less painful. Okay. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the built-in abilities of Python that you can use to uh, you know, general documentation. I'm going to give a sample on how to do things in Sphinx. Um, some things you can do the language with both Python and Sphinx to sort of abuse it a bit. Um, and how to make your presentation, uh, oh, sorry, how to make keeping your documentation a little bit less effort. Um, there is a bit.ly link with this exact presentation um, on if you guys want to follow on your own device. I'm not sure. It's up to you. Should I wait for a moment? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All done? Okay. All right. So, um, about me, um, I've been a professional developer for 10 years. I started coding, was sort of self taught from 11 years on. Uh, yeah, we got a we would try to avoid studying for history, and that's how we ended up doing computer science. So um, it's not necessarily the right thing to do. We should all know where we're coming from, of course. Um, I'm also a dad, and uh, he started crawling this weekend. So um, yeah, uh, life is interesting. <laughs> all right. Um, documentation. Oh, dear. Like, really, who, who actually likes writing documentation? Would we actually have some hands? Wow. Arr. Some of them seem very enthusiastic as well. That's pretty, pretty impressive, you know. Um, but to be honest, like, if there's documentation that you have to read about something and it's written, well, I mean, it's awesome, isn't it? Like, yay, I don't need to figure out what this guy did. I could just read the instructions and, hey, it actually works. That's great. But I still, like, really, I don't like to write it. I'm coming, trying to come up with ways of how to cheat, you know. Um, and there we go. So what documentation is useful? Well, pretty much it is documentation that targets the right audience. Um, it has to be, well, easy to find relevant information, as I said. Uh, technically correct. That's actually very important. If you have documentation that's lying to you, you're wasting your reader's time. Um, you might as well not have documentation. And then, obviously, it needs to be complete, or as complete as you can make it. This is, I think, the criteria that good documentation needs. Um, another thing with easy and readable to find is you should be able to browse and find the documentation fairly easily and not decide that you hate the color scheme or anything like that. It just must be nice. So don't do too much fancy things and you should be OK, I, sus I suspect. Now, what makes documentation completely useless? I'll think of more or less the inverse of the previous one, but especially if your documentation is, how to put it, it's worse when your documentation is incorrect. Um, incomplete documentation can still be tolerated. It's still useful. It provides a net benefit, but wrong documentation, that's something you really need to watch out for. Okay, 
Now, of course, there's this top topic of self-documenting code. Wow, isn't that awesome? I would love to have that, you know? But it is, I have to agree, it is a bit of a myth. And um, when we get to the point where computers can, uh, like, and there's infer, like, what your meaning is in your code, and what you'd actually try to achieve here, there is just one step away from trying to take over the world, so <laughs> no, let's, let's not go there quite yet. So there were some very, very good um, attempts at this um, done uh, before and still being done. I mean, I'm mentioning Java uh, Doc and Doxygen as like the first two tools that I used. And um, there's some quite nice things that they do. I mean, you have to start up with, um, you have to put in doc strings or documentation a special formatting for the documentation and like giving information on how things are and done. And the nice thing about it is because it's computer generated, it's generally complete. Um, the not so nice things is it's not necessarily, um, okay, I already mentioned that, all right. Yes, the, the, the problem with this tools as they are is they tend to generate API documentation or library interface documentation, which is really good if you're like a pro if you have to maintain this piece of code a bit later on. But what if this is the documentation that I now give to my end user or my business analyst to saying like, this is what this, this tool does, and they won't quite get what it's going on. So one of the problems of, of uh, uh, documentation with Doxygen and JavaDoc and that is that they pretty much assume that there's only one target audience, and it's not always the, the case. I mean, someone that integrates with the system doesn't want the same documentation as someone that has to maintain it, or the same documentation as someone that has to use it it's all different. And of course, uh, user documentation, I'm, it's a bit out of the scope of this. Sorry, you guys can have to write it like the hard way. So how does Python help? So Python, due in much of the way of how the language like, developed over time and had a, a, a community, they come up with ideas, they do pips, and the fact that it's an interpreted language, so there's a lot of good introspection abilities. There is quite a few things that you can use, or a few basic things that actually end up being quite useful. Um, a good example, dir. It just lists you what sub-objects there is inside any object. So it's a discovery um, a mechanism. Then you've got help. Um, this is, it essentially tries to generate a man page, man page like of, is, you can run this on the, on the, on the REPL or in Python, IPython or anything. It'll just give you a man page of, look, this is what your, your object of code or you know, the documentation is attached to it and it tries to generate it and it just happens automatically. So if you guys didn't know about that, that's quite a useful tool to say, there's this function, I know I have to use it, but I can't remember how to use it. Help that and you get documentation like on the fly. That's quite nice. And um, docstrings. Now docstrings is the method which we try and give all this code hints as to what is where you try to, in, to deliver your meaning into what the computer should like help you for generating documents. Ah, sorry, that came out terrible. Anyways, so I'm just going on and uh, giving a demonstration. So dir, um, quite simply, I did a dir of built-in, and uh, well, obviously limited array there. And uh, you can see it lists you everything that is built-in. There's a few hundred of the standard things. So um, that's just discovering what is available standard. Um, help. So with the help function, I said help enumerate, and you get this man page. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to fix the wrapping. Excuse that. But um, it essentially is just documentation on the fly in the repo of what's going on. And then doc strings. There's quite a bit more to say about doc strings. So the basic doc string is you have a function or a class or a method or a you know a package, and in there the first literal string is the doc string. So this is essentially documentation attached to that object. And in this case it says, greet person prints a greeting to person. And then the code is print greet person. It's very basic. And when you run help greet, you get greet person prints a greeting to person. Okay, that's more or less what we expected. Um, you can also programmatically set a doc string, as in um, what you see is the function doesn't have a doc string, but we define the magical variable dunder doc with the doc string. And that's essentially the same. So one of the things this allows you to do is to generate the doc string after the function if you have some kind of if you're doing some kind of meta programming, um, that could help. And you can see that the 
it works as expected. Create potion, programmatically, set doc string. Um, another thing you can do is uh, self-generate. So what I mean by that is a doc string that contains um, like a template for itself that you just have to render. So when you, uh, you can see what I did here is I added person list, which is supposed to be that. You know, so you can print agreeing to a person if person is recognized, else it tells you to go away. And the only people that should be allowed to be to greet it is the milkman, Raz, and secret agent. You know, um, so the doc string for that is pretty much exactly that. You can see here at the bottom it says allowed characters are milkman, Raz, and secret agent. So it's a just another pattern, much an extension of the first one, of the previous one. Sorry. And then we get to doc strings as properties. So now I'm sure most of you know what properties are. So properties are, as a refresher, a way of defining a variable and saying this looks like a variable. And to make it behave like a variable, here's its getter, its setter, and its deleter. So you can you know, essentially create uh, something like that. So here is another point to make is that the current property uh, like decorator or function only actually works with instance attributes. So what I did here is I subclassed it and just kind of told it to just work, to forget about the instance, so that it actually works on a class, pro uh, class instance as well. And you can see here I've got an unused doc string for class, which is the first literal. Um, and then I define a class property of a class method, and I have doc, dunder doc there as my magical variable. This is defined after that, so this overrides, and it gets um, preference. And what you'll see what I do here is, um, to demonstrate that it, it gets generated lazily, is it'll print out a statement, then generate the return, the doc, doc string. This is a very simple example, but in a case like this, you could have a function, you could have the doc string being generated to be quite expensive. Say uh, this is a um, API endpoint and it's like a get sample and so what you want to do instead is you want to run a test that actually tests that this works correctly and then coincidentally you've got the data and you might as well show them exactly what the format is of what a sample message looks like or whatever and uh, as you can see here generated doc string lazily gets printed out first then it prints out the generated doc string which is the returned one here and the one up there well that's never actually used you overrode it so this is a, a quite a, a nice way of um, helping to generate doc strings for yourself, for your own application. So now I'm going on the topic of restructured text. Now restructured text, uh, you can see the URL there. It is a um, standard, well, how to put it? You can say it here. It's, it's a mockup language, and it's got the normal standard formatting tools as you've got here. Like here, it's held from 2002, so it's actually quite old by now, but it works quite well. Um, so it's a common form of rules, and one extra thing it has is directives. Now, directives is where restructured text actually gets some of its power. So what you can do is you can say um, directive type, um, name or positional parameters. This will be then keyword parameters. Oh, I made a typo, sorry. And then attach data to um, the directive. So yes, in a, a simple example, uh, one of the standard examples of a CSV table. So if you
And in this case, it's pretty much the same thing. So that's cool. That's cool. So we know like now our, our program basically works. And I'm not going to write tests for this because this is about documentation. Um, so now you have a to get started with Sphinx, you've got a little utility called Sphinx Quick Start. And um, as you can see, it's, it's an interactive thing where you enter it and you say, what path do you want to go here? And it's actually questions. It's not difficult to get started, which is actually quite nice about it. Um, and um, so now we're going to build the docs. OK, so I run Sphinx build docs to docs HTML1. And you can see there it's busy building everything. OK, it's cool. All right, we've got documentation. So now let's see what they look like. And oh, what's that? Where is my documentation? It's just an empty thing. At least it looks like the standard Python style documentation, but there's nothing there. Like, surely, shouldn't it like magically generate these things? Well, it appears not. So, where are my docs? Like, that's important. Where are they? Come on. Well, Sphinx doesn't do any of the magic um, that docs are doing in JavaDoc or any of those other things do for you. As I said, it's um, it's actually just a Starter Officer system where you write documentation and export it to another format. But due to the power of um, how those directives and that work in uh, restructured text, you can essentially script what you want it to do. So it'll come with a, a bunch of plugins, which is ways of extending. Well, you have standard plugins, but you also have uh, plugins that extends what it's doing with directives. So here's an actual example of a, a talk tree. Um, that's a table of contents tree, and this will then render a table of contents tree of a maximum depth of two and intro and strings as we the documents that it's at the first level in this case. So this is how you then start building out a hierarchy of like documents. Um, another thing that another common pattern is you'll have a library that will generate um, some documentation for you dynamically, and then it ex exports into a uh, restructured text file. So you just you can include it verbatim. Or you can just add it as part of your talk tree, you know. Um, so that's another way of of uh, you know writing plugins and that. So there's some definitely some imp more important or well, for this talk uh, Sphinx plugins. I mean the first one I'm going to discuss is Autodoc. Now Autodoc is essentially trying to give you the Doctor Gen and JavaDoc style functionality as well. And um, the next one is Doc Tests. Now Doc Tests, this is actually quite cool. So what you do is when you have your sample documentation, sorry, and um, let's say it's, it's a how-to guide or how to use this library, you'll have a section where it says, you enter this, so this is what's supposed to happen, and voila, this is how you get started and how you use the, the tool. Um, what will happen is when you build the documentation, you can also tell it to run my doc tests as an extra option. And what it will do is it'll find any doc tests that's in a certain pattern, and it will then run and then compare it to the output to look the same. So if you write into any errors or exceptions, it'll tell you, oh, your documentation is out of date. Please go and fix it. That's, that's cool. I like that. I mean, so let's get to talk about Autodoc. So you've got um, a little helper. So Sphinx Autodoc is a helper that will just say, just script me the basic, um, you know, researchers RST documents so that I could, uh, you know, just start documenting that. It's still not quite as automated as like a tool like Doxygen or that. But I mean, I think it goes against the philosophy of how Sphinx and that works. And then you can see like the sample of doc text. You've got, uh, yes, the module and auto module. Get all the members, uh, show the undocumented members, and show inheritance. It's like the default options uh, for, for using the tool. OK, all right. So. Um, and this is then you have to remember, though, because Sphinx will tell you that if you generate a document and it's not actually attached with a, like a hyperlink to some other document, that this is an inaccessible document. So we're going to run into that issue. So we just have to add like modules to the talk tree, uh, the default talk tree that, we, that it generated for us. And now we're going to Sphinx build. And we, um, OK, let's see what this looks like today. All right. And, oh, that looks better, doesn't it? Oh, there's something there. That's great. And I'll go into doc sample. You can see the module documentation, the class documentation, all the 
functions and that, they're all like in, automatically discovered. And you're like, yeah, OK, that helps. This is at least now one way of trying to generate more documentation. I mean, the point is, so I mean, what does this actually buy us? Um, some documentation is done only in one place. That's like the ones you put in the doc strings or get generated from there. And um, so now that it's as part of the code, so that means it's a bit easier to keep track of what you're doing with that piece of documentation. You look at the code, you look at the documentation at the same time, it helps. And um, you can also auto-generate documents as part of, OK, sorry, this point, I've missed it. You, have, you can have the documentation is hosted with the code base. This is actually quite an important um, thing because what happens is you have your documentation, you put it on, say, a wiki, and everybody forgets about it. They never look at it. Oh, yes, my nice 70 page like document. Nobody's going to look at it because they don't know it's there. So the only project where people actually ever refer to the documentation is where the documentation was hosted on the project. And, and a good example is we have a, C, a CI as a Jenkins build that will, when something needs to be auto deployed to staging system, it'll also build all the documentation and deploy it along it. So there's a known place where documentation for this project would be. Um, and that's something you really actually want to do. It, um, an example is, so I've got this, we've got this project uh, that's, it's a kind of a back-end project. It does integration with um, Oracle and Siebel and it's a very much an edge case thing. So the reason why I put that project out as a separate like library modules because well, you're supposed to keep things separate. But I, like I said, in case I wanted to do it a second time, I don't want to like have to do it again or maintain it again. Um, some people are immediately interested. It's actually gotten to the point where I've had five requests from people to want API keys to the production environment that I've never heard of. Four of them are contractors as well. So, OK, all right. So this. Turns out there's actually a business case of people wanting to find out, you know, what a customer's name is and little things like that, like who's part of it and how much we're charging them. Like, some of it's a bit like suspicious, but like, it's, it's actually quite amazing that this thing that I just did as a separate module and put the documentation on there just for, I don't know, for myself, actually is being used. And it's, it's, it's almost gone viral, I guess, how viral a little internal API can really go. Um, so, anyways. You have the big problem of keeping documentation up to date. Yes, uh, that's actually quite difficult. I mean, some of the methods you have is you could actually try and generate a much more things. I mean, uh, another tool that I've often used a pl uh, plugin is to process your uh, path variables, like depending on which um, like web's uh, framework you're using, and then it supports like. Django, Bottle, Flask, Tornado. I think those are the ones that support them. I'm not sure. And um, then we'll say, oh, you just point it to where your uh, roots are. And it will automatically like find the roots, find the modules, and build the documentation for you as like this is the roots documentation when it's built. So you could do that. Or you could abuse the, the doc string to generate even more things for you as a, another way of um, you know, trying to automate as much documentation. And doc tests is a quite a convenient way to to tell you if your documentation is out of date because this is essentially test cases that run that live in your documentation um, and depending on what test run that you use, you can also run it as part of your test suite, not just when you're generating documentation. So you could essentially make it fail your CI build if your documentation test docs doc, te doc test fails. So that's another way of keeping the documentation up to date. It's like trying to keep a, how do you handle any regression in code, really? Um, so as I said, Sphinx Contra plugins is a, a place there's like a few hundred like useful little plugins that they have in this one distribution. And um, it's actually quite, it's quite useful. You'll, you'll find some interesting things there that may be of some use. And then uh, doc tests, I'm probably not going to have enough time to go through everything. So I just do a sample of like, you've got, two different ways of defining dot text as part of your structured text. One is you have a set of test code with test output. You can also have a dot dot uh, uh, initialize, test initialize or something to, this is what you need before you can actually get to the sample code. 
And another example is to do it the REPL style, where you have the three arrows, print something, you have the output, and then this will automatically get run as a doc test, um, which is actually quite a, a, nicely, a nice way to put it embedded in your code. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. OK. okay. Okay. That was a very, very keen hand. It was, yeah. So, uh, I got a bit of convention uh, on mm -hmm. specifying parameters and the types of those parameters, the return, or the type of the return mm -hmm. values. Uh, is there a way? And if we're uh, yes, there is a, there is a convention. In a certain way, is there a way to do that with Sphinx? Yes, so in Sphinx, there's a, uh, in the, what's it, the, Autodoc plugin they do document like you can you will have, you can uh, specify like uh, restructure text um, colon returns colon and then have a return thing args and then for arguments so you can actually do that as well um, I found that it's not actually that useful for um, most of these things because un unless a type is very strict and often they're not it's not that useful to define exactly how these things are you know so um, Python being the interpreted language. It's much more useful in a language like C or Java where you really need to tell them this is exactly what you can give in here else the system will fail. Often your hopefully your code isn't quite so fragile. Um, but yeah. There is a plugin plug Yes. You mean the graph goes graph too big? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's also the same case with when you try to compile the Swing's documentation, like a one of one in order to get a full array of compilation errors that comes as well. Which yes. Means that one needs to stick to the Swing's. It does, yes, yeah, Swing's. Uh, it's true. Swing's comes up with when you're building the documentation, it'll tell you. Uh, your restructured text doesn't look f sane. Like I'm not sure what you're talking about this. So often we'll print warning. Sometimes it will actually fail and tell you like outright like this is nonsense. I don't want to generate something here, which is somewhat useful. It um, at least allows you to keep a, a handle on the quality. The issue with the images being big with with uh, using uh, uh, graphers and dots. There is um, a you can actually add parameters into the graphers as part of the root node of the of the graph to try and limit the size of the graph. So you maybe hope, I'm not sure if the plugin does that, but I know with graphers you can actually you could say limit this to no more than a thousand pixels wide, and if it doesn't fit, just scale down. So then you end up with a really tiny graph, but it still doesn't go too big. I mean, it depends what you want, but you can do either of those. Um, No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. I mean, what I find is I'll, I'll have, like, say, a fabric script or something that builds a project, and then part of that is, you know, if you say do deploy to stage, one of its appearances is build my documentation, automatically put it on there. Um, I wouldn't actually put it in the setup because that's uh, you don't want to. You don't even want to pull in Sphinx as a dependency necessarily, you know. So you want to. This is you. You'll have your your basic requirements to get this tool working, and then you have the requirements to do development on a tool, which typically ends up being your testing tools and all these things. I don't think you want to litter okay. like that. Yeah, okay, I guess if it's, if it's developer documentation rather than end user. If it's end user documentation, I almost think you should, it should still be in the build script. Um, because, I mean, if it's an end user application, uh, often there's a lot more to it than just use the code. You, Use the code blob, do something with it. End users don't necessarily have the technical skill to, you know, put it into a, a proper environment and run it. Okay, well maybe let's say it's um, you know, a, li a library for Py other Python developers. Mm -hmm. and they're going to want to install this library and then look at the documentation. Um, actually, I think there is a, an option to deploy documentation in, in the newer uh, setup of uh, digital tools. Um, and I think you can just say, 
in that case, include this and run that. So I sh you should be able to do it. I, I think it's some integration with Regenerox. I can't actually remember. But I have seen there is a hook for it um, as part of like the DC tools. But I think it's only in the newer DC tools. So actually, luckily, that's upgradable. So yay. Uh, OK. Ah, thank you, sir. So I'm not one of these avid documenters, um, <laughs> but when I do do it, I, I overdo it usually. So one of the more annoyances that I found with the Sphinx comes with the cross-referencing to other um, parts of your API, so specifically in terms of uh, your API docs. Especially the auto-generated stuff. Yes. Uh, so yeah. what, what, what ends up happening is, um, I'm not going to go without the cross-referencing, so what en ends up happening is I get this very RST RST heavy doc strings um, in my code at the end of the day, which almost becomes hard to read you know, um, mm. in, the, in the code. Um, are you aware of any uh, extensions or plugins that makes that cross-referencing easier? So no, I'm not aware of any. But uh, as I, have a sim I had a similar problem um, with the one API that's REST-based. And what I actually did is I wrote a little helper function where I just say this uh, like roots, I'll just reference the root, like um, in the in the documentation in like a, a funny format, and then at the end of the function, I would just run it through, and this would then resolve what this root's name should end up looking like if when API doc or just HTTP doc was generating. So it was a bit of a hack. It's one of the th one, one of the reasons why I was kind of recommending learn to make your doc strings like generate themselves. Not sure. Sphinx does have ASs. Yes, it does. More name oh, but but this part of the problem with the auto, like the auto doc, so okay. it'll discover and generate things. So it will yes. automatically reference something, and then you have to find out what his name is. And the name ends up probably in being like something canonical, like mm -hmm. it'll be myth like package dot package dot yeah. underscore package dot class name dot variable name dot instance of this and that. And it'll be this long thing. I think this is what he's talking about specifically. Like if you name it yourself, you can give it a nice short name. And you have to add the, for instance, class uh, la label before, before your actual uh, yeah. reference string. Oh yes, the document so wherever it ends up. Yes, and uh, that should be trivial to uh, infer from the code. There, there is some of the things I have been like a bit annoyed with things. Um, I, I do like the fact that I, that it just honors your doc strings and it's quite easy to Generate documentation when you do some metadata programming, but they, that that is a very much an annoyance. I, I don't know how to get around it. Maybe I don't know. Maybe we should just file an issue with them and say, like, how can we do this better? We have a sprint topic for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that could work. Uh, and if you have any hack code, I'd like to see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. You've got your sprint topic for tomorrow. Well, I can only make Sunday. I can't make tomorrow. Oh, then that's Sunday. There you go. Catch up on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, thank you.